to Ask an Atheist. We are a weekly educational call-in program dedicated to atheism, skeptical inquiry, and the separation of church and state. We come to you live every Sunday afternoon in Seattle from Scan Studios. Uh, and we're archived online at uh, askanatheist.tv. My name is Mike Gillis, and with me this week in the co-pilot chair, Casey Doran. How's it going, Mike? Good to be here. Good to be here, too. Yeah. Yeah, given the alternative, it's raining outside. <laughs> and that's why we hope you're watching, because you don't have anything better to do, right? Scan television. Yes. Keeps them off the streets. <laughs> so um, we have sort of an interesting program today. Um, we don't really have any announcements, aside from the usual stuff about Scan, uh, scan TV. As you know, um, and we've mentioned this over the last couple weeks, Scan Studios is in kind of a precarious position. Um, they basically have the contract with Seattle to provide a public access station. Um, however, they have sort of an, an interesting uh, budget situation. One, there's a huge budget shortfall. It's like $67 million. Yeah. And uh, in, most, in most of the areas of the country, a cable access network, that does not come from tax dollars. It actually comes from cable franchise fees that uh, Comcast has a deal with the city of Seattle to provide uh, their cable. Their cable. And uh, as a consequence, that's the thing that uh, Seattle gets out of it is they said, okay, we'll, we'll give you that contract, but part of it is you have to provide an access channel for the community to create their own local programming. Uh, that's where SCAN comes in. Um, most places, that, those franchise fees go directly from the cable subscribers to uh, the channel itself. That's not the case in Seattle. Instead, it goes into the general fund, which means whenever we have a bad economy, a situation sort of like this, we're sort of at the whim of a lot of politicians. But right now we're talking about cutting all sorts of things. So uh, what we need you to do as, uh, as viewers of a SCAN program, like Ask an Atheist, uh, we need you to contact the Seattle City Council. Go to scantv.org. Let's get that magical boop right there. Um, there's a lot of information on there, how to contact City Council members. Let them know that uh, you are watching Seattle programming, even if you don't live in the Seattle area, that people are using this this. Uh, this uh, this service and uh, uh, public access can be a little weird at times, but I kind of think of it kind of like you know public arts funding that I think it's worth paying for the occasional Bigfoot fake the moon landing show <laughs> to get to programming like this because we're one of only two atheist specific television programs in the entire country. Right, and and the one, the most important thing to remember is that uh, this show goes on the air because Scan offers their equipment, training, studio resources for free. <clears throat> So uh, if Scan goes off the air, it means that we, that every show, including ourselves, will either just cease to exist, or we'll have to find a way to get itself back on the air on the internet and in some other in some other capacity without the aid of the equipment, the training, and the staff and resources here. So it's very important to keep Scan alive. It really is, and like I said, there's only two programmings like this in the entire country, and they are both on cable access that if the cable access option is taken away from us, it costs a lot of money to get a show on TV. Yeah. That if you look on a lot of Sunday mornings <laughs> like, like today, um, you will see local televangelist preachers like Casey Treat right. and Mars Hill Church. They have their own TV shows on, <coughs> on regular network television because it's you know, not a lot of people watching TV on Sunday mornings generally. Right. But it costs thousands of dollars to get those spots. They have to buy those spots from the local stations. And uh, that's something we generally don't have. Like Casey said, the access to the equipment and the, uh, the resources here at SCAN and the studio is what makes this show possible. So please, please contact right. them. Right, yeah. And uh, we don't want to see anyone go off the air unduly, even, even those people for whose views we think are kooky and crazy. That was it. <laughs> Um, so the next thing we wanted to go to, I think, was uh, we wanted to do emails first before anything else. So the first one, we just got this yesterday, and this is, uh, this is I take it by analogy, the rule of thumb that people like Michael Pollan always say, where they say, look at the ingredients on the side of the, the package of food you buy from the grocery store, and if the ingredient you can't pronounce, then you probably shouldn't eat it. Um, well, unless you're Ill illiterate, I think at that point, <laughs> if you, you know, sugar... <laughs> I don't even think you'd be able to do that. I think you've got comics. bigger problems at yes. that point. Then. But this, so someone uh, emailed into us. Uh, his, I guess his uh, nickname is Byron. I suppose um, he wanted to to say that he was a, I am a quote, quasi panentheistic Wiccan based eclectic neo pagan. And so far, I found your little show. That I found very little on your show that I've disagreed with. What, what I, is it? I don't know what a... Quasi-pan-theistic, <laughs> Wiccan-based, eclectic neo-pagan? It sounds like you're saying you're kind of pagan. 
it seems like that's a lot of uh, a lot of things that just mean kind of pagan. I, right. I really don't know why there's a, a lot of syllables there that are just kind of well surplus. So quasi panentheistic. So panentheist is what the you believe the universe is God. So, so is it, sort of the the universe is sort of God. Is it sort of the universe is God, or is it the universe is sort of God? I don't know. The only sort of the universe we can know. So, uh, I we just find that stood out particularly because someone bothered to actually try to structure a series of adjectives out to describe what their belief is, but in the end it comes up to not much. I don't not know. Much. Don't know what it is. Anyways, his question, he he actually says this anyway. Ellips ellipsis. My question is this. Total non sequitur. It is possible that hypothetically is it possible that hypothetically speaking a godlike being could could or has evolved could evolve or has evolved. So I think the question is um, the question that he's really asking is so the, our definition of a god is pretty narrow. Um, you know we think of Yahweh or the the monotheistic creator god, one being responsible for but solely responsible for the entire universe, and he's asking. Um, it, does this have to be supernatural and magical? Can it, you know, or can it be something that evolved through natural processes? Well, I mean, I don't know what you think about it, Mike, but um, the way I sort of approach this is I'll look at that idea of panspermia, right? Mm -hmm. Where that's the that's the idea that maybe some sci-fi folks have have that uh, say, well, maybe life didn't actually start here on Earth. Maybe like you know, interstellar space aliens came by and threw down some, you know, I don't know, some globs of meat with DNA on it, and then that, that somehow started itself up and eventually evolved into beings. In that sense, like, you can say that there, that if in that scenario actually happened and that those beings themselves just evolved from somewhere and became technologically significant, that our gods, our creator gods, could have themselves been creatures that have evolved. But, I mean, it all depends on really what your definition of God or God-like well, being you're, is. Well, you're immediately um, arguing against the sort of Christian definition of a God. Uh, the idea of, you know, the, the wonderful thing about Yahweh is he's the only one. Right. Um, but the thing is, you, you, if you're going to evolve, uh, people really need to understand that that's not how evolution works. We're not all shapeshifters. I'm not changing from one species into another during the, the course of my lifetime. Um, Evolution, very simply stated, is change in gene frequencies in a population over time. So for this being to evolve, he has to be part of a breeding population. That means Yahweh can't be the only one. It has to be one of many gods who are right. breeding and changing and, and have to be mortal. Right. Otherwise, the gene frequency wouldn't change. Um, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. So you're immediately sort of taking out the Christian Islamic uh, uh, Yahweh sort of God, Yahweh Allah, that sort of uh, as monotheistic being who is actually there before the creation of the universe. This is something that grew during the course of the universe. Right. Um, yeah, it just it it doesn't really work. I think yeah, it is possible that you'd have something like Q or Mixius Pitalik or the genie from Aladdin. You would call you know godlike mm -hmm. something. But again, you're going to get into what uh, it's called Clark's third law, yeah. which is that uh, any advanced technology, sufficiently advanced is sort of indistinguishable from magic. Like if I were to go back in time uh, and go hunting with a group of Neanderthals and brought out an AK-47 and took down a Mastodon, they would be convinced I had a magic stick. They would have no frame of reference for understanding what I had. Right. Yeah, and uh, so that's why this, this question is sort of hard because it rests on the equivocation of godlike. I mean, di even different gods that people actually believe in have differing qualities. I mean, I guess we our conception is, as you said, kind of omnipotent, outside of time, creator. That there's only one of them and whatnot. You know, some people have a little bit gods that are a little bit more mundane that exist in sort of a pantheon of gods, animistic gods that exist in smaller. You know, um, gods that aren't immortal. You know, I mean, there. Are, I guess in the Greek mythology, there are some gods that can can die. Basically, can, well, they can exist. It seems like they're they immortal in the same way that like Tolkien's elves are immortal. They can be killed through violence, but it's right. not like you know Zeus is going to grow old and die. But I mean, he still he basically killed his dad, right? And who killed so, his dad? So I mean, they I, I don't can know if die. there's I don't know if there's really an answer. I mean, uh, uh, the answer to the question is I suppose if we're using the Clarkian definition. Yeah, another being, another creature in the universe that appears to us godlike because they have technology that we don't could exist through natural evolution, but that's the hard part to. I'm also really not going to make the assumption that something does exist without that positive evidence. I, I I'm not going to simply say, okay, there's a there's a hole in my knowledge, and this hypothetical being could fit into my knowledge. Therefore, I believe that that being actually exists. 
Um, that's right. not it. That's basically sort of appeal to ignorance. It's a God of the gap sort of argument. Um, I need positive evidence for something. It's like I can't say with 100% certainty that unicorns or leprechauns have never at any point in, in time on any planet anywhere in the universe ever existed. I can't say with 100% certainty they haven't. Mm -hmm. However, I don't have any evidence to believe that they have. And it, once you take that sort of argument, that negative evidence argument, you sort of have to apply it everywhere and there really is no end to the sort of things that you'd have to believe in, right. including things that are contradictory. Well, if you believe in things that are contradictory or otherwise strange, uh, the number is 206-421-5658. Um, we'd like to hear what you have to say. If you happen to be a quasi-panentheistic, uh, Wiccan-based, eclectic neo-pagan, I think we would, do, we would definitely do for a little bit of clarification as to what that is. I, I don't understand why you need to, to, to clarify neo-pagan. It's not like there's a lot of, you know, paleo-pagans that you need right. to compare. It's not like there's an old-school druid <laughs> around anymore. <laughs> That you need Wait, to sort of I think you wanted to hit on with. the second half because that was a little... Yeah, uh, anyways, this, this question of could this being have evolved. If so, it wouldn't be out of the question for humanity or another race such as dolphin ants or the fair folk. I, I, I assume you're, you're referencing Tolkien's elves there because you make some nerd references later, so brownie points for that. To attain similar status or more plausibly for us them to create something that would be equal or greater to uh, the hypothetical god being and use it as a bargaining chip against the aforementioned being. Are we talking about Cylons now? Uh, we might be, actually. Um, no. Maybe creating a robot similar to the Vision or Red Tornado and sticking it on Arnold to become president of California. <laughs> That's, that sentence is awesome, but I, I have no idea yeah, what it know, means. I don't know where he's... I have no idea what it means. I don't, I don't know what Vision or Red Tornado... Wait, Vision is Vision the Vis character... That shoots lasers out of his eyes from no, that's Cyclops. Marvel. No, from from uh, from Marvel. Well, he does Avenger, shoot lasers out of his eyes. Yes, he's he's a okay. The Vision is an android robot who's a member of the Avengers. Yeah, and Red Tornado is a robot who's a member of the Justice League. <laughs> See, so robot. That's I don't even this, imagine what this, that would this be. This guy's like. got a superhero team fetish. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> oh, Apparently. robot, robot superhero. He's right. not as cool as Ghost Robot from Venture Brothers. So. <laughs> no. So yeah. Anyways, I I really don't know what what point you're making with the last bit, but right. that sentence is on its on its own kind of awesome. Well, thanks, Byron. We, we, we it was a it was a great email to get. Do you want to do an, another quick email, really quick? Uh, you go for it. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we have one from Carlos uh, from Mexico. Greetings from Mexico. I first want to say I love your show. It's really awesome, and I'd first like to help me figure out an argument that some believers use to prove the Bible is 100% accurate. Um, scientific truth. In Isaiah 40.12, they use the word globe to refer to the world. The person who pointed this out to me said that this is proof that the Bible predicts that the earth is round. I know this is a weak argument and it contradicts other verses in the Bible, but I'd like to know what you think about it. Uh, well, one, first of all, it doesn't say globe. And actually, I, I think it just, the, the actual thing, I actually looked this up, it just talks about God being able to hold every grain of sand in the world in his hand. Um, it doesn't say anything about globe, but here's the thing, is even if it did, it doesn't prove everything else in the Bible is true, especially the supernatural claims. It doesn't, um, like for instance, you can talk about one thing being accurate in a story that's on the rest of it completely false. Like we were talking about that earlier, like Spider-Man lives in Manhattan. And I can even tell you in the comic books where, what neighborhood Spider-Man lives in. He lives in Queens, that's a real place. However, a lot of the other stuff in the Spider-Man stories aren't true. The same way that Sherlock Holmes lives in London. Right. He lives in a real city, and they even reference real places in those stories because the writers of these stories lived in those places. Uh, just because the Bible gets one point right, like you said, it also contradicts another place where they say there was a character four in the Bible. Right? Yes, yeah, so there's a character who stands on a mountaintop and is able to see the four corners of the world, and the earth is immobile and held up by pillars. It gets so many other things so dead right. wrong. They also think that pi is three. But yeah, but also this is the this is it's part of a, this strange thing about translation as well too. So when we when we're identifying a particular word and it has a loaded meaning, like so for his claim, for example, is. It's globe, and a globe is a word that we associate with a spherical object and what have you. But the version of the Bible that he's reading, which may be in Spanish, I'm not entirely sure, is has gone through a period of, we're actually going to talk about this later, uh, gone through a period of translations out of their original, um, if we're talking about the Old Testament in, in medieval Hebrew, up through the years, probably into Greek and back to various places, all the way back to where we are now into a language very far away from where it was originally written. 